Is America Babylon? I'm reading from a 1974 book, The Vision, by David Wilkerson. Moral standards among many church people will be shattered. Husband and wife swapping will be on the increase. Great numbers of young people will simply live together without getting married. A constant barrage of sex and nudity by all the media will vex the minds and souls of the most devout children of Christ. It will cause the love of many to grow cold. It will lead to carelessness and faithlessness. It will be the major cause of a great falling away. Those who stand against this flood of filth will be few, and they will be looked upon as out of step with an enlightened society and a more relevant church. Easy abortion, the pill, and a growing sexual permissiveness will contribute to a revolution of immorality which will finally end in a baptism of filth so widespread that the human mind will be unable to take it all in. Lovers of sensuous pleasures will far outnumber the lovers of God. Be aware and be warned, this is a full-scale war against God's children. Divorce and immorality will be more and more commonplace among ministers. A growing number of priests will be involved in sexual affairs and will leave the priesthood. Others will continue in the priesthood, but will carry on secret affairs. An ever-increasing number of Protestant ministers are going to fall into sexual sin, much of it carried on secretly. I have had a curtain pulled back and, as it were, a vision of what is happening secretly to thousands of ministers and very devout people. Beneath all the piety and behind all the false fronts are secret affairs being carried on, hidden from the eyes of men. Among them are some of the most devout and well-known. Some very religious men and women are cheating and indulging in secret sex sins. They deplore their sin, and they know it can never be accepted as right, but they seem powerless to withstand the force of this personal moral landslide. Unless they are extricated miraculously, it will lead to shipwreck and disaster for many homes and churches. I see coming a day when every true minister and priest of the gospel will face his greatest hour of temptation. Those who thought they were beyond temptation will be tempted and most severely. God will keep and deliver those who turn to him with all their hearts. Those who continue to flirt and indulge face a terrible hour of despair and failure. God will soon deal with secret sin with such fury that his judgments will begin to fall on the right and on the left in the lives of those who persist in their sins. Those who forsake secret sex sins and will be renewed and healed. What I have heard and seen is an urgent message from God's throne room. There is sin in the camp, and it must be purged. The hour has come when God will lay the axe at the root. He will cleanse his house and will sanctify his vessels for service in this midnight hour. The number one temptation for the last Christian will be prosperity. The Bible warns that in the last days, many Christians will be half-hearted, rich, prosperous, and in need of nothing. There is nothing evil or sinful in being prosperous and successful. Most of the patriarchs in the Bible were wealthy men. However, I see millions of Christians being deceived by prosperity. The last Christian is going to be afflicted by prosperity and tested by it more than through poverty. In my vision, I see Satan appearing before God one last time, as he did to accuse Job in the Bible. But this time he comes to ask permission to tempt the last Christian. Here is what I see. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered, From going to and fro in the earth and observing the last Christian. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered these last day Christians? How dedicated, how upright, how God-fearing and Christ-loving they are. How they try to run from your evil plots. Then Satan answered the Lord, Yes, but just take away the hedge you've built around them. Job wouldn't forsake you in his poverty, but just increase and bless all the last Christians far beyond anything Job ever had, and then see what happens. 
make all these last Christians affluent like Job, build them fancy new homes, give them fine automobiles, all the money and gadgets they need, swamp them with campers, boats, world travel, fine clothes, exotic foods, land holdings and savings accounts. See what happens to your last Christians when they become full rich, increased with goods, and are in need of nothing. They will forsake God and become self-centered. I see automobiles, clothes, motorcycles, and all kinds of materialism becoming a bigger hindrance to the Christian than drugs, sex, or alcohol. I see thousands of Christians attached to and obsessed by things. They are so wrapped up in materialism that they become lukewarm, blind, weak, and spiritually naked. Yet in the midst of all their materialism, they are miserable and totally dissatisfied. In my vision, I see Satan standing back and laughing with glee. Look at all the money-mad Christians, all the clothes hogs, bitten by the security bug, making heaps of money, buying all new furniture, getting bigger cars, buying two or three of them, buying, planning, selling, marrying, and divorcing. It ruined Lot's generation, and it will get you too. Look at the well-paid, easy-living, big-eating Christians getting lazy, lukewarm, and becoming easy prey. God, pour it on them. It's getting to a lot of them, and it's making my job easier. I see many of the last Christians who were once lovers of God becoming shipwrecked by their obsessive love for pleasure. Lovers of God find no pleasure in drugs, illegitimate sex, alcohol, tobacco, or smut. The devil knows that. Most of these fleshly pleasures offend and repulse the Christian. I see thousands of Christians sitting in theaters, exposing themselves to degrading influences they once abhorred. They have not given themselves over to any particular sin, but they have become very comfortable in their addiction to off-color movies, numerous parties, socials, and wine tasting. They really love God, but they love their pleasure even more. They are not really sinners before God, just strangers to him. They have become so busy swinging and trying to live a liberated Christian life that they have changed drastically without knowing what they have become. The sudden evacuation of Christians from the earth will catch many of them unawares, They have become socialized gadabouts who can't find one hour anymore to talk to God in a secret closet of prayer. I see the sin of the future as the misuse of leisure time. This has nothing to do with weeks spent on vacation. It's not the time spent touring Europe or the Holy Land. It's not a hunting or fishing trip. It's not hours spent surfing, boating, water skiing, or horseback riding. These things are all legitimate and good in themselves. I'm talking about all the wasted time. The time that a man has for himself to choose what he will do with. Time that could be spent in reading God's word. Time that could be spent in the secret closet talking to the Heavenly Father. I see Satan coming again to accuse the last Christian. Look at the last day Christian, the television addict. Look at him, hours and hours for soap operas, comedies, sports, but no time to get alone with God. He turns God off with a dial. He hunts, fishes, travels, plays golf, tennis, and basketball. He goes to movies and parties and has become a gadabout, but he has no time to read his Bible or pray. Is this the last day Christian who is supposed to walk by faith? Is this the one whose faith will overcome the world? Is this the one who is to prepare for a coming day of persecution and world chaos? Are these the playboy Christians upon whom the ends of the world will fall? The greatest sin of the future against God is not abusing the body, indulging the flesh, or even cursing his name. The greatest sin against God now is simply to ignore him in a day and age in which he is calling so clearly. I see an ironic development. The last Christian who lives so much closer to the return of Christ than the early Christians spends the least time of all in his presence. The message of coming judgment and the return of Jesus Christ will not register with so many Christians who 
for the same reason that the message in the pending doom did not get through to Noah's generation, because they were so in love with the pleasures of buying, selling, planting, and lovemaking. The next selection is from Jonathan Edwards. This was a sermon he gave on July 8th in 1741. Consider this, you that are here present, that yet remain in an unregenerate state, that God will ex execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he will inflict wrath without any pity. When God beholds the ineffable extremity of your case and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength and sees how your poor soul is crushed, and sinks down, as it were, into an infinite gloom, he will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear the executions of his wrath or in the least lighten his hand. There shall be no moderation or mercy, nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor be at all careful lest you should suffer too much in any other sense." then only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld, because it is so hard for you to bear. Ezekiel 8:18. 8, Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Now God stands ready to pity you. This is a day of mercy. You may cry now with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But when once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away of God. As to any regard of your welfare, God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued in being to no other end. For you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. There will be no other. <coughs> Excuse. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there will be no other use of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to Him that it is said He will only laugh and mock. Proverbs one twenty five twenty six. How awful are those words! Isaiah 63, 3, which are the words of the great God. I will tread on them in mine anger and will trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. It is perhaps impossible to conceive of words that carry in them greater manifestations of these three things, contempt and hatred and fierceness of indignation. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful cause or showing you the least regard or favor that instead of that he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly and it shall be sprinkled on his garments, so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the most, uh, the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And this is from Leonard Ravenhill. This is a book written in 1979, America is Too Young to Die. Remember with concern the symptoms predating collapse of the mighty Roman Empire. In his classic study of that mighty military machine, Edward Gibbon cites the five primary causes for the dissolution of that great society. The rapid in, one, the rapid increase in divorce and the undermining of the sanctity of the home. Two, the spiraling rise of taxes and extravagant spending. Three, the mounting craze for pleasure and the brutalization of sports. 
Four, the building of gigantic armaments and the failure to realize that the real enemy lay within the gates of the empire and the moral decay of its people. Five, the decay of religion and the fading of faith into a mere form, leaving the people without a guide. Are these five fingers of death gripping the throat of America or England today? There's another uh, study on Babylon by Dr. Stephen Anderson who writes, this is from the book of Revelation 18.3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. How much hath she glorified herself and lived deliciously? So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Revelation 18. I'm not sure that verse. If one believes that John was prophesying an eschatological entity, in effect, Mystery Babylon, there is virtually no basis whatsoever. And, let me start over, if one believes that John was prophesying an eschatological entity, in effect, Mystery Babylon, and that the Roman Catholic Church is not the primary source of evil in the world, then there is virtually no basis whatsoever for the identification of Babylon the Great with Rome. A study of Revelation 17.1 to 19.5 shows that Babylon the Great is the world's great power in the end times. The following facts emerge from an analysis of this section of the book of Revelation. 1. Babylon the Great has the largest economy in the world. It is the center of wealth in the world, and it is responsible for an extended period of global wealth creation in the end times. 2. Babylon the Great has shaped global culture in the end times in a directly anti-Christian manner. Three, Babylon the Great has the greatest political power of any entity in the end times. Four, Babylon the Great is considered to have the strongest military in the world in the end times. All of these characteristics uniquely and definitively match the USA. It, the USA, uniquely makes all the nations of the world wealthy, reigns over the nations of the world, imposes its culture on all the nations, and leads them in a massive downward spiral of materialistic depravity that culminates in worldwide worship of Satan and the Antichrist during the second half of the tribulation period. These are things that can only be done once, and the United States is now doing them, never before in history has a single country held this much power. Now this is from the Master's Voice Prophecy blog, uh, July 6, 2019, posted by Celestial, What You Never Heard Before. Call unto me, and I will show you great and unsearchable things, and difficult, which thou knoweth not. Jeremiah 33, 3. As soon as I got up today, 8.51 a.m., the Spirit of the Lord said to me, Celestial, take your scroll and write down what I will say and show you. Today I will say what you never heard before. So I sat and prepared to write, and this is what I received. This word is strong. Thus says the Lord to the nation and people of America, I will do a new thing. I will declare in your hearing a word you have not heard before, a word with attention to detail so you know that it is real. You often wonder if your name is in my word. 
I hear it all the time, is America in prophecy. This is the subject of much stark and heated debate. I declare to you openly, you are indeed in my book. You are Babylon the Great, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, and the whore riding on the scarlet beast. You are my enemy, and now I lay my hands securely on you for reckoning, for punishment, for repayment of your sins that have multiplied under heaven until there is no place I can rest my eye without your abominations searching me out to distress my spirit. You have defamed me among nations. You shared the cup of your overflowing filthiness among the peoples. There is no border you have not entered in some measure and defiled it so that my eye cannot spare them. Indeed, you have made them all defiled. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I will pluck Babylon out of my root, out by her roots. From her very base, I will overturn her and shake the nation out like clothes until everything in her that can be shaken will be shaken. I will shake the nations and finish the kingdoms so the kingdom of my own dear son can come and I will begin at the head, at the root, at the source and fountain of all abomination. Babylon the fallen, Babylon the lustful, Babylon the pornographic, Babylon the foul and adulterous, Babylon the pedophile, Babylon the fornicator, Babylon the killer of innocence, Babylon the whore who tries my spirit. You will no longer be known as Babylon the great. You are not great. You are nothing to me. You shall be as nothing in front of everyone before long. It is not long Babylon, until my blows break your back, then you will remember, I am the Lord God Almighty who lifted you up, who made you what you were, because I did not make you as you are now. What you are now is an utter abomination. So let me read your charge. The nation of evil princes prophesy to Babylon, a nation of evil princes, their hands have grown fat off the sweat of the people, and the nation is under a curse because of their greed. These taxpayer dollars they hoard and squeeze out of citizens are not enough for them. No, they take gifts and even flesh as payment too. They take food and meat, wine and drink, credit cards and luxury apartments as their due in order to cast their votes to pass laws or block them. They take holidays, trips, presents, jewelry, and other tokens of servitude to make their presence felt on the Senate floor and in other positions I have let them hold. They even take male and female servants, male and female concubines to satisfy their unending lusts. They abuse human flesh and say, you've done well, we'll be in touch. I see the daughters and sons of elected officials being offered sexually to other elected officials in return for favors. They swap their children and their wives to promote their careers and think nothing of it except as the price to get to the top. The wives are very often made to do oral sex on a regular basis for princes who take a liking to them. To the point these women have become skilled in this deed God hates. Some are willing to see it as a team effort, a sacrifice for their husbands. However, some are boiling inside to the point of bitterness, rage, and outward manifestation of disease because of these acts. I see Senate wives, mayoral wives, governor's wives, even lower housewives and those in low government positions, women married to men with an insatiable lust for power, I see them developing heart disease, nervous disposition, fainting spells, uncontrollable shaking, anger, depression, outbursts, and public breakdowns, loss of health and vitality, even cancer, all because of hatred, rage, and anger inside them at being made to kneel like slaves in front of men they don't know to perform sexual favors so their husband can be promoted to the rank he desires. 
When the woman thinks about what she has to do after the gala, she faints. When she thinks about what she'll have to do after the state dinner, she shakes. When she thinks where she'll be in a few hours when her children need her at home, she is filled with rage. The princes also use these women unnaturally in their anal parts. They commit sodomy with them, then send them home to their husbands, who try to comfort their crying by saying, Honey, I'm doing this for us. Can't you see that? This has been going on for a good while. I see in future some of these women will come forward, but some won't make it. They will kill themselves, and their families will never know why until the scandal breaks. America, hear this. Your fascination with oral sexual activity has made you lewd. This is the word of the Lord. It has made you lewd, lascivious, and foul, like the frog spirits from the book of Revelation. This is Jezebel's work, yet you continue in it. It is no accident that your leaders enjoy it. It is a type of high perversion and will bring your downfall. It is also an untraceable form of fornication. Your highest office fell to this in scandal. This is Bill Clinton she's referring to. This act leaves no proof that can destroy a person's career with illegitimate children or allegations of rape. This is the act of choice among your leaders. Repent. I see the type of husband who does this, the process he goes through. These men and women at the very top are like skilled hunters seeking fresh meat, and they know how to find it. They identify someone with a beautiful wife or desirable children. They target him and bring him in. They pay him attention and make him feel important. They heap flattery on him and mention his contribution to government thus far as impressive, linchpin. This word linchpin is used excessively on lower court judges who want promotion and want their decisions in court to become famous. This flattery is done to senators, district elders and councilmen, etc., who desire promotion to higher office. Policemen, sergeants, judges, lower house representatives of all races and backgrounds. This is even done, ladies and gentlemen, to traffic cops. Even traffic cops, who usually keep their wives safe at home, bring them to the cops' balls and other events. The princes see these women with their working-class husbands, men who love their families, and decide, like, I like that one, I want that one. They shop among the spouses of their subordinates and begin to make plans like Potiphar's wife to snare and seduce these women. After the husband receives early flattery, he receives a few gifts. Things he doesn't have or can't afford. Chief of this is personal attention. He is invited to boys' clubs activities. He's invited to yachting parties, private golf, etc. Things he always heard about but never dreamed he would ever attend. At these events, he receives staggering attention, a commodity among men that's hard to beat. Note a word to wives on this blog. Give your husband attention. If you do not, somebody else will. Men crave and thrive on being appreciated, thanked, admired, and made to feel relevant and useful in their homes and society at large. They want to know they belong somewhere and that somebody is happy with their contribution. This feeds their spirit more than physical food, so if you have ears and your marriage is in trouble, may you please hear this advice. After these men are groomed with friendship and attention, groomed with being asked their opinion on, on important questions of the day, they are filled with desire to belong to this group. They think they've found like-minded brothers who will help them make a better America. But what they don't know is they've stumbled into a band of swingers and sexual perverts who simply want to defile their women and children for momentary pleasure, then watch their homes disintegrate. Sexual immorality kills the soul of anyone who touches it. Many of these political homes and famous homes were already smashed because of others touching the wives and children inappropriately. When you see them smiling in big magazines, know that many of them are walking dead, frozen and damaged inside because of rape and sexual molestation. They paid the price for power, but now when they finally have it, Everyone in the family is abused and defiled. These princes make suggestions of ways to accelerate a man's path to power to get him interested. Then they reveal to the husbands what they want. Many say no the first time. They are adamant, never. 
but with time and soothing words or threats, or simply if the desire for promotion is too tempting, most give in and prostitute their kids and spouses for a leg up. I was just a teen when the movie Indecent Proposal came out. This movie depicts a real scenario, friends. My money for your wife. Indeed, the Lord is telling me this is one of the fastest tracks to the top. If your wife is beautiful like Abraham's wife Sarah, she'll be your fastest ticket to the big time. Even those who haven't officially entered the power race yet but want to be considered for entry pass the bodies of their wives and children to those higher up in order for the door to be open for them. This is abomination. This is the sentence of the Lord. Elected officials will die. They are a hateful bunch. Have they not heard that he who perverts justice and denies bread to the poor I will not endure? They are manipulative puppets who play to the tune of their master Satan and their other master money. I said in my word, you cannot serve two masters, but you can do it when both of your masters are Satan. I will remove them one by one, and the lucky ones will be alive to tell the story. Prophecy. There will come deaths among elected officials of the United States like a wave. There will be a marked uptick in official bearing across the U.S. I see an extraordinary order of casket flags being made in order to bury these people. Indeed, they'll be scared thinking someone is assassinating them, but it isn't. It's the Lord Jesus Christ judging them. I see a hand reach out roughly to gather so many senators, governors, and mayors, etc. They look like people at the same time, like grain stocks being harvested. Some stocks fall out in the developed parachutes as they fall to the ground. They will have lucky escapes because God will not totally destroy them. They'll end up shaken but not crushed or destroyed. But the majority of those gathered stay in the hand and get crushed. The stocks are pulverized, broken, and thrown into fire. Prophecy, many elected officials will lose offices. For three weeks, the Lord has told me, they will lose their races and I will expose them on all sides. Many who think themselves assured of a Congress or other type of power seat will lose their races. I saw their names scrubbed from the ballot box as the party declined to reinstate them. I saw new and unknown names being put up for consideration. I see those who view public office as their meal ticket start to go hungry as they are kicked out of office and new people take their spot. Upset, landstide, upstart. He sure tumbled him out of there. I see such phrases abound in the media circus as new and literally unheard of faces come to power and incumbents are let go. The voters are doing what they think best, but I hear God say, it is not enough, it will not help. Prophecy, scandals will surround them as they fall. I see brown envelopes abound in the Senate and the House of Representatives. I see faceless people bringing brown envelopes to high and mighty hands. When they are open, the hands begin to shake. They get weak. The person is shaken and terrified, gets up in the middle of a House or Senate session, and leaves the room never to return. Photographs, tapes, documented transcripts, all evidence of what they do. I see scandal and exposure coming to the White House itself in the form of another revelation about the president. I see men of high posture who will like to be dressed up like little children and taken advantage of by dominatrix women. I see men of high office who like to wear collars and pet gear and be beaten with sticks and rods as they beg their master in sexual role play. I see many small children entering the hidden chambers and rooms in the homes of many celebrity pastors, celebrity stars, famous ones, and yes, even the White House, Senate, and all levels of gubernatorial dwellings of the United States. Some of these children will come out again looking worse for wear, but many will not come out. They die from sexual abuse and misuse of their body by multiple people at one time, and their remains are disposed of for extremely high sums of money. Prophecy. This is sex and murder for profit. I am shown this is a briefcase business, as in money changes hands to dispose of these children. 
I declare to you by the revelation of God, this is a thriving business of disposing of these little ones because people desire the corpses for other things which the Lord has not shown me right now. Children are raped and murdered in the continental United States and all our territories. America has carried this thirst for infant blood to all nations which she annexes, controls, influences, or has ties with. This is the territorial spirit of Babylon the Great, the spirit of witchcraft, Satanism, and murder. This is the revelation, word, charge, and judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ to the United States of America. There is more to follow. As always, take these matters into prayer. Seek God. Do not view these messages lightly. They are not play. I'm not here to gain fame for such bitter revelations. When you see me write this, know I'm actually writing that real people have died, and I saw how they died. It means people are dying right now somewhere as you read this, sitting in basements and underground chambers knowing they won't see sunlight again. Such prophecies wear on my heart because they are graphic, they are cruel and raw, and contain scenes of violence and painful things I have to see. We think prophecy isn't real. We think it's words on a page. I assure you these are facts revealed by God. So truth, Jesus Christ, can expose every hidden thing before the end of time. When you read, please pray for the victims, for their souls to find rest, for some miracle rescue to happen, for anonymous tips or helplines or task forces to interrupt their fate, for snatched children to be found, for abuse victims to speak up and break the chain. Pray until it changes. I'm going to read, that's the end of the prophecy. I'm going to read from Oswald Chambers, the, my utmost for his highest, the August 15th entry, The Evidence of the New Birth. You must be born again, John 3, 7, and hope people will consider this. The answer to Nicodemus's question, how can a man be born when he is old, is only when he is willing to die to everything in his life, including his rights, his virtues, and his religion, and become willing to receive into himself a new life that he has never before experienced. This new life exhibits itself in our conscious repentance and through our unconscious holiness. But as many as received him, John 1 to 12, is my knowledge of Jesus the result of my own internal spiritual perception, or is it only what I have learned through listening to others? Is there something in my life that unites me with the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior? My spiritual history must have as its underlying foundation a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. To be born again means that I see Jesus. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. Am I seeking only for the evidence of God's kingdom, or am I actually recognizing his absolute sovereign control? The new birth gives me a new power of vision by which I begin to discern God's control. His sovereignty was there all the time, but with God being true to his nature, I could not see it until I received his very nature myself. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. 1 John 3 to 9. Am I seeking to stop sinning or have I actually stopped? To be born of God means that I have a supernatural power to stop sinning. The Bible never asks, should a Christian sin? The Bible emphatically states that a Christian must not sin. The work of the new birth is being effective in us when we do not commit sin, if not merely that we have the power not to sin, but that we have actually stopped sinning. Yet, 1 John 3, 9 does not mean we cannot sin. It simply means that if we will obey the life of God in us, that we do not have to sin.
A.W. Tozer writes, The blessedness of possessing nothing. Before the Lord God made man upon the earth, he first prepared for him by creating a world of useful and pleasant things for his sustenance and delight. In the Genesis account of the creation, these are simply called things. They were made for man's uses, but they were meant always to be external to the man and subservient to him. And the deep heart of the man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Without, Within him was God, without a thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. But sin has introduced complications and has made those very gifts of God a potential source of ruin to the soul. Amen.